Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The registrants for this event span geography and time zones. So I'm going to wish everyone a good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening. My name is Francine Davis Jacobs. I'm a member of the Brandeis class of 1995 and president of the Alumni Club of Houston. Professor Mursky was originally going to travel to Houston this spring to speak at a faculty in the field event for our region. And while we were not able to hold that event in person, we are thrilled, thrilled that he agreed to lead this virtual event and share it with alumni, parents, Brandeis National Committee members and friends literally from all around the world. So to introduce our speaker, Yehuda Mursky is a professor of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies at Brandeis and on the faculty of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. He teaches courses on Zionism and Israel, Jewish intellectual and religious history, and human rights. Professor Mursky has written widely on politics, theology, and culture for a number of publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and The Economist, The Daily Beast, and The Guardian. He is also the author of the widely acclaimed volume, Rav Cook, Mystic in a Time of Revol Revolution. Professor Mursky previously worked in Washington as an aide to then Senators Bob Kerry and Al Gore, and at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and served in the Clinton administration as a special advisor in the US State Department's Human Rights Bureau. We are super thrilled and excited for him to join us in this virtual space today. Welcome, Professor Mursky. We look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. Um, and thank you, Sharon, and everyone in uh, Institutional Advancement for uh, making this possible. And uh, welcome, everyone, all of you. You can see me. I'm afraid the technologies of um, Zoom are such that I can't see you, but um, Thank you all for taking the time. Um, as we talk, there will be a chat open and uh, my colleagues will be uh, taking your questions in. If you say something in the chat um, to, that you want to be a question during our Q&A period, uh, please, like they say in Jeopardy, um, state it in the form of a question. <laughs> I don't know if the rewards are gonna be quite like you get on Jeopardy or, or the entertainment, but please do state it in the form of a question. Um, and of course, you know, ordinarily professors don't encourage the passing of notes during class, but I'm sure this is an opportunity for you all to like say hi to one another and so forth. And to the extent to which um, you're, you're sitting here in front of your screens listening to me talk about what might be some very depressing things, there's also an occasion for you to meet and be in touch with one another, um, then please, I'm, I doubt that uh, that would be delightful. Um, so, you know, our topic today, the topic today, the sort of like uh, Jews today on the, what I said on the anvil, as I called it, uh, between the universal and the particular. Now, um, believe it or not, we actually came up with that title several months ago when, <laughs> when this was said, you know, we were planning on making a visit to, I was planning on making a visit to Houston and talking about this and it seemed like a nice topic. Um, and that of course uh, was before everything right um we're living through a really remarkable time um for the past several years actually i keep telling the students you know we're living one vast open air seminar in uh foundations of social and political thought and they should keep their eyes open um i also remind students that so much of what we study so many of the texts we study were written by people who were living through large and regularly calamitous historical times themselves. Sometimes, right, say, you know, when, when I teach and we talk to students about things like Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, um, you know, there's very clearly on the table, right, here's a scholar trying to make sense of just like, what the heck is going on here? Um, you know, how has my civilization fallen apart and committed suicide? But other times, even when, you know, sometimes I'll point out to students you know, we could be discussing some medieval text of theology, you know, Jewish theology or, or Jewish law on even like nothing relating to persecution or martyrdom, you know, just like commercial law or the laws of the Sabbath. 
And as it turns out, we know that this text was written during the middle of, say, the Crusades or the Black Death, which is to say that times like these just, I think, really right, heighten the stakes and drive home the importance of the things that we do and our efforts to try to understand. Um, and I'm not just saying that as somebody who teaches, thankfully, for a living, um, but as all of us who try to think through these times. Another challenge of these times is, if I make, might make another preparatory comment, but just also give you some sense of, of teaching at Brandeis these days. Um, as an instructor in a university, not in a theological seminary or someplace like that, you know, I, I don't see it as my job to indoctrinate students. And I don't see it as my job, I don't see it as befitting to try to indoctrinate students. Um, not just because of, in my own political views, not just because of some, um, you know, rule or other of the American Association of University Professors or something like that. I'm, I'm not even sure if there is such a rule. Uh, but more in terms of what, what are our moral duties as, as educators these days, and in general, within the framework of the university. And, and, and our moral duty is to try to help the students uh, figure out how they can best understand their world and their worlds and make their choices in those worlds. Um, and indoctrinating them into my own point of view, however correct I may think I am, really runs counter to that, that, that moral obligation. And that's an obligation that's a place where like morals and so to speak epistemology, like what, where like how we know about things and how we act in, in the world and things we think about doing in the world, that's where they meet. Um, and those, even though technically, like, you know, most of my courses aren't technically moral philosophy courses, but those are, that's the idea that I, the thinking that I bring to it. Um, and there's no such thing, of course, as entirely value-free education. Value, right? There's, there's all pedagogy has certain assumptions, including assumptions about values and morals. And yes, I'm in many ways an old-fashioned humanist and think that our chief um, conviction is that human beings can understand one another even when they disagree, even when they violently disagree. Um, a year and a half ago or so, I was a guest professor in a law school in, in, in New York, and I was giving a course on um, uh, law and state, in religion and, religion and the law and, and the state in Israel. And at one point, I was describing the ultra-Orthodox point of view. And one student raised their hand and said, wait a second, you sound like an apologist for them. I said, no, I'm you know, trying to work like a scholar and I want to understand how they see the world. You know, that's what humanists try to do. We try to understand people even when we disagree with them. You know, I try to understand the founding fathers, the founders of, they were mostly fathers, yes. The founders of the liberal tradition that I inhabit. You know, I also try to understand Nazis as they understood themselves as best I can, bearing in mind that I can't always understand, right? Um, and the reason I say this is because this is all very really put to the test these days, you know, in the classroom and, and otherwise. Like, you know, it's very, very hard to maintain this kind of principled pedagogic neutrality in the classroom. It's very hard. And, you know, I try to maintain this somewhat neutrality when I'm speaking in fora like these, where I'm just trying to, you know, I'm not trying to convince you of anything, I'm just trying to like lay out how I think we can help under, we can perhaps understand some things that are complicated these days. Um, but it's very, very hard to do that. And so invariably some of my own political views are going to color things that I say here, but I am actually trying to understand and including trying to understand those who disagree with me. So thank you for bearing with me uh, during this introduction, but I think it's, it's important to say it for a whole bunch of reasons. So this question of, you know, Jews between the universal and the particular, um, is of course an age-old question, but the particularly acute form in which it's pressed itself home to me and I think to others in recent years was really during the 2016 presidential election here in the United States. Um, as as you guessed from the introduction, I've you know been following American politics, you know, not just only personally as a citizen, but you know, professionally I mean, for a very long time. Um, and this was the first, 2016 was the first election 
that I can remember in which the place of Jews in American society was in play in an election campaign. Now, not that Israel doesn't come up in presidential elections. Um, it does, um, but also within a relatively narrow bandwidth. I mean, yes, you know, I certainly um, well recall, you know, the arguments over, you know, giving Jimmy Carter a second term in office, right? I'm old enough to remember that. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and election cycles before, you know, and what people thought about Richard Nixon and what people thought about George Bush, the father and Israel. But those arguments, by and large, were within a fairly pretty narrow bandwidth. I mean, you know, you never had an American, Ameri never had a major American presidential candidate, you know, saying that, you know, in, since the 1960s. Uh, saying that America should fundamentally rethink its, you know, or, you know, George Paul, that sort of people here and there, but like America needs fundamentally to rethink its support for Israel, nor if since the 1960s have you had an American president saying, you know, Israel can do whatever the heck it wants, whenever the heck it wants, and if Israel wants to like, you know, unilaterally declare a state and like, you know, just impose whatever it wants on anyone, yeah, they should go right ahead. I mean, some people interpret, you know, the green light that America gives Israel for all kinds of things in those ways. But that's never been American policy. Certainly, that's never been the way it's been discussed in presidential campaigns. And then in 2016, um, you have a president who seems to be saying that, but more crucially, American Jewry's place in American society is somehow on the table. It's, it's somehow an, an issue. Um, you have, and, and, and to make it even crazier, right? You know, over the years, you know, I mentioned there were disagreements uh, or there were opinions about whether this or that American president was quote unquote good for Israel or bad for Israel, but whatever the con prevailing consensus was, it tended to be shared uh, between the Israeli government at the time, whatever it was, and American Jewry, right? There was not a whole lot of daylight. You know, you, 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 you know, it's sort of at the margins, but by and large, not a whole lot of daylight between um, Jews in the United States and Jews in the state of Israel over whether or not someone was, a candidate was fundamentally good or for Israel or well predisposed towards Israel, right? And here you have that. You have a candidate president who was in many ways not well, until recently was wildly popular in Israel. Now, in the last few weeks, his luster has faded so much. You have a candidate who was wildly popular in Israel and who American Jews not only disagreed with but were terrified of in very large numbers, um, while other American Jews just thought this was great. And you have. Um, you know, and, and sort of a, a, what governments, I mean, sort of, the, this is the political, I'm giving you so like a, po a political discussion. So like the political service, before I start doing a deeper dive into history, philosophy, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you have government, you know, historically, uh, one thing that, you know, you know, you never had governments in the United States actively seeking to foment, you know, severe disagreement um, among American Jews, right? You know, the story I love to tell is, you know, this organization, the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, with many of you are probably familiar, and how did it come about? Because in the 1950s, John Foster Dulles, then Secretary of State, was tired of taking, on any given issue relating to Israel and the Jews, had to take phone calls from like a dozen different Jewish organizations, and he called Nachum Goldman of the World Jewish Congress, and long, Chaim Weizmann's uh, longtime aide, and said, I'm tired of this, okay? Just like get me one Jewish leader, one phone call, that's all I wanna do, and hence the Conference of Presidents, which we know to, to the present day. And now we have an American government uh, that revels in arguments between American Jews and Israel and enjoys um, American Jews uh, tearing each other apart and so on. And, and this happens, this becomes, this became an issue in 2016, not just episodically about like, you know, how were people going to vote in, you know, well-known centers of, of Jewish population, like, you know, New York or Florida or something like that. But it seemed to be resonating with larger themes of the campaign and American politics and not only American politics. 
And this sort of brings us to the, so the, the nutshell of what I want to talk about is that I think the reason why Jews and Israel have become such electrifying and electrified topics in recent years, part of how we see anti-Semitism as an issue in American politics and people harboring genuine doubts as to whether or not the president of the United States actually thinks anti-Semitism is a bad thing. It's sort of like the mind bending um, feature of this question. Another, an additionally mind bending feature of this question is that the president of the United States has a, a son-in-law who is a self-described Orthodox Jew, um, whose daughter uh, converted um, to Orthodox Judaism. How does all this happen? How, how, how do these, how does, how does, so the point that I want to make is that one of the fundamental issues roiling the world in our time is a tension, a dichotomy, a duality, a reciprocal relationship. And I'm using all these different terms because these, because this functions in all these different ways between, it's called the universal and the particular between people as seeing themselves as part of a specific group with ethnic features, part of a certain religious community, certain place, certain language, certain history, a certain culture on the one hand, and their values, their core values, um, reflecting them those, that kind of belonging, and uh, the universal. People seeing their values as coming from some sort of more universal ideal. And there's lots of different kinds of universalism, we talk about that. And that their affiliations are less tightly connected to things like ethnicity and place, and sort of the forms of religious life that sort of are very tied to those kinds of notions of ethnicity and place and language so on, um, but are broadly shared across the globe to those who happen to share their views. Now, so much of what we argue about in our world in recent years is very much over that, right? Is there one truth? Is there one truth for everyone? Um, Ordinarily, one would say, well, empirical science. Uh, but one of the things we see in the corona crisis, and we st we're seeing it in recent years in the debates over climate change, global warming, um, that even questions of science, you know, which we thought were well settled that there's such a thing as an empirical truth about that, turn out to be very tied to issues of politics and culture and ideology. And people's economic interests are defined also in terms of their politics and culture and ideology. And the thing with the Jews, is that this question, this tension, this inter this complex relationship between the universal and the particular um, is with the Jewish people from the beginning. And Jews are both potent symbols of this divide as well as actors and players in how this divide works out, especially in the last couple of centuries. And that's the idea in a nutshell. And I'm going to sort of unpack all of that. So if we start with the Hebrew Bible, right? We start with the Hebrew Bible. And, um, and the Hebrew Bible, right, the book of Genesis, the, the, the entire book of Genesis, if you take a look, it's, it, it's at one and the same time. It's the story of a universal God uh, who creates the world and the universe and everything and operates by certain universal moral principles and who then develops a particular relationship with one particular group of people, one particular family, which becomes sort of a clan and a tribe. And then, okay. um, I'm gonna just backtrack for a second. In some ways, what we're talking about here are questions of identity. And what do we mean by identity? Identity is meaningful collective belonging. What are the groups of other human beings that I belong to in ways that give me meaning in, in my life? Now, ordinarily, 
we don't worry much about identity. I mean, I don't know about you, but I first learned about the term identity in high school geometry. And there I learned it's like, you know, identity is like all, all things that have three sides are triangles that, you know, they add up to whatever it was like 180 degrees. And so like this, these three sides that are 180 degrees are a triangle and, and no matter how they're shaped, right? They're, it's a triangle, it's a triangle, it's a triangle. Triangles don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about their identity, right? Sort of the preoccupation with identity is itself a sign that something's amiss, you know? Um, the, the, uh, triangles don't spend a lot of time worrying, gee, am I the kind of, what kind of triangle am I? Um, can I, did I choose to be a triangle? What kind of triangle do I choose to be? Am I the triangle that my grandparents were? Is that okay? Would my grandparents have been proud of me? And would they have thought that like the way I'm being a triangle is like the way they were different than from how their grandparents are being a triangle? Triangles don't worry about those things. The term identity as we used it also has a history. My colleague in, in Neges who formed New Research Genetic Studies, Jonathan Krasner, has done marvelous research on the history of the idea, this term identity, especially as it's used in American Jewish life. Right, is, is it has a history, and if you take a look, if you compare, um, you know, the so and, and identity generally has three parts. I, I regularly one one very helpful way of capturing what we mean by identity. It was offered by the late great Israeli sociologist Shmuel Noach Eisenstadt, um, who you said used to talk about. He said there are three kinds of identity: what he called primordial, civic, and transcendent. Right, um, primordial sort of the people, the community into which you're born, people with whom you have ties of blood, place of origin, that sort of thing. Civic, the people with whom you don't have those kinds of ties of blood, but with whom you share your society and your social, social space. And transcendent, the values that stand over and above you, um, the values that stand in judgment on your life, the values, you know, the ought that you try to get to from your is of your life. In a way, um, what Eisenstadt is doing there is recapitulating what Aristotle does at the beginning of his politics. Remember, at the beginning of his politics, Aristotle talks about how society evolved. Well, we start with families, and then a bunch of families and clans get together and they create a village, right? So we start with the primordial ties, then the civic ties of the village. And then from there, eventually, we get the city, the metropolis, right? And we know that ideas of transcendence as we know them in the Western world, in, the ancient, in Greek philosophy, in the Hebrew Bible, in Chinese civilization, in India, in Persia, a whole bunch of places very much related to the evolution of these like large metropolises and large empires as you get these much larger all encompassing moral and spiritual ideals, right? And they all sort of in Aristotle's scheme, they all, they all sort of emerge very serenely out of one another in kind of process of teleology. Um, and for Eisenstadt, a modern sociologist, no, these three elements are like, you know, in a reasonably well integrated in human being or society, the, they're hopefully working together. And when they don't work together, that's when problems happen. Right? And these three elements of primordial identity, civic and transcendent are also very present throughout history and also very much in Jewish history. So getting back to the Hebrew Bible. Um, a wonderful illustration of this issue is the fabled story in the book of Genesis when God des decides to destroy the city of Sodom. And he says, well, Abraham is my God. Abraham is the person I have designated to teach my universal message of truth and justice. And so I really need to share this with him. And God shares with, with Abraham his intention to destroy the city of Sodom for its wickedness. And Abraham famously argues with God and says, in Hebrew, the judge of all the world will not do justice. Um, and they sort of, they bargain back and forth on this. And, you know, Abraham, so to speak, bargains God down to, well, if there's 10 righteous people in Sodom, um, which is to say there's a, a unit of a genuine community of righteousness, right? Because 10 is sort of in, in biblical, in the biblical world, is sort of like the smallest unit of, of like meaningful community. Um, if you have 10 righteous people in stone, I won't destroy it. Okay, is that good for you? Fine, now I go and you know the rest is history. Or biblical history. Now the thing is that Abraham argues with God on the basis of universal moral principles, right? He doesn't say, God, it says in your Torah, or God, it doesn't say in this Jewish law book. No, he says, God, you are the just, you are the judge of all the earth, and you must do justice. Abraham is saying, God, there's a moral law. It binds me, and it binds you, as you are the guarantor of that law. So there's the universal piece, universal ethical moral piece. And why is Abraham, but on the other hand, why are Abraham and God even having this conversation? Because God is in this special relationship with Abraham. It creates that relationship, creates the intimacy between Abraham and God, where Abraham can argue with God. And so this 
fundamental duality starting in Hebrew scriptures and works all the way through. That Jews and Judaism are committed to teachings um, and ideas that on the one hand are fundamentally saying that there is a universal God and the moral principles of their religion are fundamentally universal, right? Applicable to all people, all times and all places. Um, and indeed the rabbis of the Talmud, as, as some of you know, elaborate, you know, so they have what they call the seven laws of the sons of Noah, which is sort of like the fundamental moral code of binding all of humanity. And at the same time, people who have a covenantal relationship with God and a specific relationship with God and their own way of dealing with God, right? And then in the course of history, there developed in Western civilization, there developed two other versions of biblical religion, right? That that, that trace this differently, namely Christianity and Islam, right? Where um, Christianity, in a sense, maintains this notion of Israel, of being in a covenant with God, right? But it's no longer quite, and again, there's a long history about how this happens and exactly when it happens, but it's no longer quite tied to the ethnos, the ethnic character of Israel, nor is it tied to is the, the laws of Israel, right? You know, there are... You know, like St. Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female, nor bondsman or slave, all are one in Christ Jesus, right? Um, which, as scholars have pointed out, on the one hand is a wonderful universalist message. On the other hand, it sort of says that if you insist on maintaining your particularity after the proclamation of Jesus, um, then, you're a pro then you've got a problem. <laughs> I mean, the Bible has, the Hebrew Bible has a rather differentiated set of ways of looking at nations. It's not Israel here and everyone else over there. For some purposes, yes, but for many purposes, no. If you look through the Hebrew Bible, all sorts of nations have different sorts of moral characters and different kinds of relationships with God. Paul kind of reframes it, right? And then later Islam also reframes it as, you know, there is, in Islam, Islam doesn't talk about, you know, doesn't talk to see, see itself as Israel, see itself as Ummah, sort of a nation or a people but the collective people of God. And Islam, as we know, sort of has a place within it for distinctive, distinctive places of Jews and Christians, right, as, as each one is al kitab You're like a people of the book, which is to say people who have been given revealed scripture by God. Okay. Now, through Jewish history, I'm going to stick with the Jews. It's what I know to talk about, and there's sort of the center of our conversation here. Through Jewish history, of course, there's all kinds of ways in which the universal in particular get mixed and matched in Jewish thought, in Jewish ideas. This also plays out with how Jews relate to secular culture. You know, the rabbis incorporate, um, the rabbis of the Talmud as, are trying to recreate Judaism after, um, after the destruction of the temple, uh, incorporate a lot of ideas from the Greco-Roman world. Um, so the idea of a universal oral moral law um, which the rabbis see as reflecting how they interpret the Torah, as well as reflecting the oral traditions that they've interpreted, that they've received about how to interpret the Torah. Obviously, in the Middle Ages, the great project of Maimonides to integrate biblical religion with, um, with Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotle and a bit of Plato, um, goes for Maimonides. Again, okay, it's a great example of Jewish integration of the universal in particular. Maimonides, at the end of his code, at the end of his magisterial law code um, of the 12th century, uh, the Mishneh Torah, uh, portrays the messianic age and who is the messiah he's plato's philosopher king right so the messiah is a grateful and also in my mind he's got the perplexed who is the messiah the messiah there is a messiah the messiah that's talked about in in the bible uh, the messiah the messiah is somebody who restores jerusalem the temple and all of that and is a philosopher and is a philosopher who like knows how to who has mastered who has used reason to discipline his passions and to live his moral life and sort of in the, in the, in the, in the, Philip, the messianic kingdom. There's nothing miraculous or supernatural about it, right? You know, the, the Messiah is a well-ordered, rational, ethical person. And the messianic kingdom is a well-ordered, rational, ethical society that at one and the same time reflects um, a, a rational, moral person, a rational, moral ethos and order. And, and creates a society where people are able to develop themselves into the kind of people who can maintain a rational moral order, right? And, and that's what the Bible is talking about. I mean, so it's, it's this remarkable synthesis of the universal in particular, and we see it in all kinds of ways in Jewish history. Then we get to modern times. Modern times gets different. Now, something that we crucially don't remember well enough is that um, through up to modernity, 
okay. up to, and for our purposes, modernity here is kind of starting in the early modernity, is sort of starting with the, with the expo Spanish expulsion of 1492. And then, of course, modernity is like fully arrived with a bang by the time we get to the French Revolution of 1789. Up to then, Jewish communities had a lot of autonomy. They had a lot of legal authority over themselves, right? And they weren't alone. Pre-modern society, you know, the modern nation state, as we know it, is a modern thing. Now, often you hear in the academy, oh, nationalism, it's all this modern invention, you know, imagined communities. A while ago in one of my courses, I asked students to define nationalism and a doctoral student who's an excellent doctoral student and clearly learned her lessons well in her other courses said, yes, nationalism is an imagined community concocted by, you know, modern publicists and propagandists in order to in order to foster hegemonic power relations, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's a little bit of truth to that, but I'll get back to that in a second. Throughout history, we see people see, thinking of themselves as peoples. I mean, what's interesting is that so much, so much, some of the most trenchant criticisms of this modern notion, this very contemporary notion of nationalism is this entirely constructed, entirely imaginary thing. Um, and with some of the most powerful criticism that interestingly come from people who are students of ancient history or classical history, people who, who do the history of the Roman Empire, uh, people who do the history of the Persian Empire, people who do the history of like African and Asian empires. Um, you read them and they say, look, of course not, like all through human history, you know, if, if nationalism is this entirely invented thing, why all through history are people rebelling to cast off foreign, denom foreign domination? Why are all these people chafing against imperial rule all the years and not always talking about it in terms of religion? Because also many ways religions, we know it doesn't quite exist in those years, um, in, those, in those times and places. So it is like the idea that there's something like a people, that you belong to a large group of people to whom in some way you're ethnically connected and geographically connected and what we can call culturally connected and connected to religion. And that, has, and that also like, can have political meanings. That's been with us throughout human history. What's distinctively new in modernity is this idea of the nation state, that there's such a thing that, that, that this nation, that this, that this kind of people, it is formulated as an idea of a nation, and it's very connected to the idea of the state, right? That the nation is intimately connected to the state, and that the state is, that a state consists of one sovereign with one set of laws in a well-defined geographic area, you know, and, and one monopoly on the use of course of force. How does this relate to the Jews? Because in pre-modern society, there were all kinds of overlapping kinds of belongings and jurisdictions and laws. Jews were just one part of it. You had, within one principality, you have laws for Jews, and you have laws for the church, and you have laws for this guild and that guild, and then you have different prerogatives that are related, that, that are reserved for nobles in terms of how they handle their estates and so on and so forth, right? And Jews are part of this, and within that, Jews have a lot of self -made. And so both Jewish community is very well defined, on the one hand, in sort of the political, geographic, cultural areas around them are somewhat ill-defined, right? France, as we know it, as this thing called France, and there's only like one place on the map called France, doesn't exist until the modern period. Germany doesn't exist in that sort of way. We have Germanic lands where people are speaking German and doing Germanic kinds of things, but Germany is this unitary state. So modernity sees the emergence of the nation state, and with that, the emergence of the nation. And that's how the Jews become a problem. Because what do you do with them? What do you do with them? On the one hand, right, you're only supposed to have one set of laws in a new nation state. So you can't really have these independent Jewish communities with their own laws. But do you make them full-fledged citizens? Well, kind of. But A, many of these countries still have some sort of Christian character. And of course, there's huge differences here between Protestant and Catholic countries and also and, and Eastern and Western Europe. And so on, I'm speaking broad brush generalizations. But what exactly is the place of the Jews? Right? You have the famous formulation at the time of the French Revolution, to the Jews, as individuals, everything, and as members of a people, nothing. Right? Sort of, the modern nation state tries to reconcile the relationship between Jews as a people, right? and also Jews as a people who have ties across borders, whose religion is very similar to Christianity and yet different in crucial ways, 
right, whose ties across borders are not only of ethnicity, but also of religion. And the idea of a nation, of a modern nation state with one, with citizenship as a universal category. So Jewish life becomes problematized in that way. And the idea of the universal in particular becomes problematized in that kind of way. As the universal in particular becomes a tension of the modern state, right? Um, you know, we have nationalism arising as a political force in the modern world for many reasons. One of them is as a reaction against the enlightenment idea that there's such a thing as a universal human being, right? So the enlightenment has this, you know, certain forms of enlightenment um, have, uh, have, you know, uh, some of the, you know, like the kind of radical enlightenment we associate with Voltaire, um, you know, that there's a certain kinds of British uh, enlightenment, but there's, there's like not a whole lot of, you know, th there's one universal human reason, and that sort of creates a model of what a human being is. There is a, ra there is one version of reason, there is a rational person, there is one way to run a good society, there's one way of human development, and it happens to be the way of reason and progress and all of that, right? And then romanticism pushes back on and says, no, there's passions, and there's also passions connected to places and ethnicity and belonging and all these kinds of things. Now, so there's Jewish existence in that way becomes a question or a problem. By the end of the 19th century, people are talking in Europe about the Jewish problem. Most famously, Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism, who offers Zionism, the Zionist movement, as an answer to the Jewish problem. I'm going to sort of go to the to the, to the um, end of the 19th century and then sort of double back for a second. Um, one of the most important essays I think ever written in this whole story in Jewish history is written by a very important Zionist thinker, writer named, whose pen name was Ahad Ha'am, Asher Ginsberg, who was the leader of sort of, he was Theodore Herzl's most powerful critic from within the Zionist movement, very important Eastern European Jewish writer and intellectual, and um, a Zionist in many ways, but very critical of Theodore Herzl's idea of political Zionism, because in, in, in response to the first Zionist Congress of 1897, Ahad Am writes this essay called Zionism, the Jewish Problem. And he basically says, you know, and he says, when people say the Jewish problem, the Jewish problem, all Europe is preoccupied with the Jewish problem. There's really two problems. There's the problem of the Jews and the problem of Judaism. The problem of the Jews is what I've just been talking about. Jews don't have an obvious place in this new configuration of the nation state. Hence, you get anti-Semitism. Right? It's not that people didn't dislike Jews before, as we know, they very much did. And throughout history, and since everything we're talking about today is just yet one more instance of how Jews became this thing that's sort of speak good to think with. You know, you can work out a lot of your issues about otherness and about identity and what you think about law and the spirit. How come the how come how come William Shakespeare writes a book, a play called The Merchant of Venice, and there hasn't been a Jew in England in several hundred years? Among other things, because Jews are good to think with, he wants to explore issues of law and grace and being an insider and being an outsider. And ah, a Jewish merchant with a beautiful daughter. Wow, like, you know, what a Jewish money lender with a beautiful daughter. Like what a great dramatic device to, with which I can dramatize these, these, these other questions. Now, I mean, part of what Theodore Herzl realized, and he wasn't the first, it was realized around 20, 20 years before him and then by an insufficiently famous thinker named Leo Pinsker in a book called Auto Emancipation, that this new form of Jew hatred that we saw, I mean, what was so striking to people about modern anti-Semitism was that, that people were used to, you know, the sorts of, say, I just mentioned Shakespeare, early modern, right, really important early modern author, talks about, you know, Jews, and it's like, it uses all these anti-Jewish themes and ideas, but in ways that are still very tied to Christian ideas of law and grace and people rejecting Christ and all that sort of thing. Not to belittle the concerns of people who really see a problem with Jewish rejection of Christ. <sighs> Modern anti-Semitism is different because all of that is supposedly done with. And it's not being stated in those terms. The, anti the officially self-described anti-Semitic party in um, Vienna, led by Vienna Mayor Karl Luger, um, isn't arguing about the sacraments, the meaning of the New Testament. It's, it's talking about Jews as a bad influence on modern society. Jews are responsible for all sorts of terrible things. Um, Jews are the symbol and bearers of everything that's disturbing about modernity. Right? In many ways, anti-Semitism, and by the way, just think about this term anti-Semitism. A, ism. Ism means an ideology. It's a modern ideology, right? Ideologies are these very, this, what do we mean by ideology? Ideology is this distinctively modern notion that human society and politics are an artifact that can be made and remade at will. Even the most far-reaching biblical visions of transformation, right? 
um, in the Hebrew prophets. You know, the lion shall lie down with the lamb, that kind of thing. There's still a king, right? There's still a society. There's still classes. It's just, it's great that all the classes will get along with one another. Um, Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. We're not doing away with the idea of princes. We're just redefining what a prince should be. Um, and, and not that there still won't be Jews or bondsmen for St. Paul. I mean, you know, slaves or bondsmen. There will, but it kind of won't matter in that. In modernity, you have this idea that society, we have this idea of policy, we have this idea of movements, we have this idea that society can be made and unmade at will, hence ism, right? Liberalism, socialism, nationalism. Now, anti-Semitism, what's Semitism? Right, as the historian Deborah Lipstead has pointed out, there is no such thing as Semitism, right? The Semite is this category that comes from linguistics of like trying to look at like a certain branch of West, of certain branch of languages in Mesopotamia. Or a certain sort of collection of ethnic groups. It's a term that's sort of like it's like you're struggling to talk about Jews in a way that doesn't sound like the way you used to talk about them in the Middle Ages, because your argument with them is different. Now we take a look at a lot of so a lot of what's distinctive about modern. I mean, you have all kinds of Jew hatred in 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 in, in pre-modern periods, and of course, you know, with with the rise of Corona, so many people pointed out like Jews were blamed for the Black Death in the Middle Ages. But what you don't have in the pre-modern world is this idea that Jews are everywhere and nowhere in pulling the strings behind fortunes and empires and, and media empires and shaping public opinion in ways that nobody notices, nobody talks about. Now, at first it seems that anti-Semitism is ridiculous on its face. These, these ideas, these anti-Semitic ideas are ridiculous on their face, right? Because the idea is that Jews are simultaneously, you know, evil bankers and socialist revolutionaries. Jews are these, you know, thin-blooded cosmopolitans who want to leech everybody from forms of belonging um, and from meaningful forms of belonging. And at the same time, there are these religious obscurantists who stick to their, you know, fanatical laws and all of that. Right? I always say, you know, it's one of the reasons why people love to beat up on George Soros, because he's like three for one, you know, he's like, or, or you get, you know, he's like, you get bang for your buck. You know, he's European, he's Jewish, he's socialist, he's capitalist. I mean, it's everything. So on the one hand, this seems crazy, but the thing is that it was also all true. Because there were Jews who were bankers, international bankers, Rothschilds being only the most famous example, and there were Jews who were socialist revolutionaries. And there were Jews who were like radical cosmopolitans, think about the people who invented Esperanto, right, the universal language. And there were Jews who were like sticking very, you know, vehemently to their specific religious traditions. Orthodoxy is a self-conscious ideology. And that's because modernity really scrambled the conditions of Jewish life, as well as giving Jews new possibilities, new possibilities for amassing power, political and economic, new opportunities for advancement with new kinds of, new kinds of professions, like lawyers taking on a, being the profession of the law taking on different form, professional education, university education, the world of journalism, which right, Theodore Herzl was both, had both the law degree and was a journalist, was a very exemplary figure. And so Jews are in the middle of all this. And Jews are in the middle, right? Um, and it's so funny, like funny, horrible. Stalin calls Jews ruthless cosmopolitans. And he himself is preaching this new kind of like revolutionary universalism where everybody has to be part of this classless society that is ostensibly utterly cut off um, from pre-modern tradition, religion, and all that, even though at the end of the day, we'll have to speak Russian and sort of act like the way people did in the Russian Empire, only be even more terrified than they used to be in the world of the Russian Empire, and so on. And by the way, the other piece of Akhadam's critique of Theodor Herzl is that Jews, that the problem is not that the, the crisis facing modern Jewry is not just the problem of the Jews, which is to say Jewish economic, social, and political disabilities, but the problem of Judaism, right? The attacks of sort of the way the bottom falls out on the, uh, out, of, out of Jewish tradition because of modern science, modern philosophy, as Ahad Am puts it very arrestingly and speaking from his own personal experience. Now the problem of the Jews, you know, doesn't really happen until there's like a certain kind of society going, undergoing certain kinds of changes and, you know, certain kinds of certain kinds of political social developments. The problem of Judaism happens every time a yeshiva student can get his hands on a copy of Spinoza. And Chada Am argued that Theodor Herzl had had perhaps some sort of answer for the Jewish the problem of the Jews, but none at all for the problem of Judaism. A little unfair to Herzl, but that's for another time. 
And this issue of the particular and universal became a major axis of debate, also in modern Jewish thought, people arguing about the problem of Judaism. How does Judaism see itself as one at the same time, a university of religion, a dispensation, a set of ideas of philosophy, teaching universal moral principles, while also caring deeply about one particular thing? And in a sense, you know, what's so interesting, a book I highly recommend to everyone is by uh, my colleague at the University of Virginia, James Leffler, L-O-E-F-F-L-E-R, called Rooted Cosmopolitans, uh, punning on um, that line of Stalin's. One of the things that he, he talks about in the subtitle is Jews and human rights in the 20th century. I'm just using it as an example of the way in which this is a much more complicated question than we usually think. If you take a look, okay, just give a quick snapshot in time. It is three days in December, 1948. You have the passage of universal, United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You have the um, passage of the Genocide Convention and you have the passage of the UN Resolution 194 that, end, that, that ends the Arab-Israeli War of 1948-1949 and recognizes the existence of the State of Israel in its pre-1967 war. So you have what's so interesting about these three days in December that happen like one after another, 19, December 9, 10, 11, 1948, is that you have the UN, the post-war world, coming out, of, coming out of World War II, affirming on the one hand, on the one hand, universal human rights, and on the other hand, the Jewish right to a nation state, and the people involved are all the same people, right? The people involved in, in getting the human rights work through the UN are also Zionists, and they don't see any contradiction. Why? Because after the Holocaust, they come to the conclusion that in order to secure Jewish well-being, you know, before the Holocaust, Jews tried to secure, it's a whole long story, but Jews tried to secure a lot of their rights as national minorities within states that really didn't work. And so Jews realized they simultaneously need to embrace a regime of universal human rights that every human being, by virtue of being born, has a basket of rights that no state can take away from them. And Jews need a nation state of their own. So you see this dynamic playing itself out again and again. And then we come to the two great Jewish communities of the present day. I've gone on a bit. I'm, I've done this long-winded historical philosophical introduction because I think it gives perspective that one often doesn't see elsewhere. And we'll provide a, a background for, for conversation and perhaps about more contemporary issues. We have the, today the two great centers of, of Jewish life are the United States of America and the state of Israel. And while speaking, speak, while indulging in broad brush generalizations, and forgive me once again for that, American Jews, by and large, have embraced the universalist dimension of Jewish life. Right? They, they, their, their outlook is sort of, so to speak, horizontal. Um, the, the challenge of American Jewish life is in maintaining one's Jewishness within a broadly liberal society, right? In which these, um, in which all sorts of ethnic and religious identities matter, but are not meant to matter legally and politically. And so Jews have done, in many ways, a very good job of sort of reframing their Jewishness in terms of universal moral ideas that can speak to people um, across boundaries of all sorts. Right? And Israeli Jews have developed a Jewish nation state. Their attitude towards Jewish tradition has been to sort of to go very deep into it. Um, and if, if one reads, you know, sort of if you compare works of theology written by American Jews, written by Israeli Jews, you can sort of sense that, you know, American Jews are like engaged in this broader conversation with all, with, with all sorts of groups and seeing themselves that way. And Israeli thinkers are very much plumbing the depths of the meaning of their existence in this place, in this state, in this land, with these people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this issue of the particular and the universal has very much played out in recent years because it also relates to the tensions around Finally, I mentioned it, globalization, right? Around globalization. Globalization seems to efface these national boundaries, right? This plays out in questions of trade. This plays out um, in questions of, I mean, so much of COVID-19 is a function of globalization, of people moving freely all over the globe. Barack Obama, part of his appeal to so much of the American electorate was precisely that he seemed to be this very universal person, right? He was from, he was from, he was from Kenya and he was from Hawaii. Um, and he was from the North Cambridge, and he was from like the North side of Chicago and the South side of Chicago, and he was from all of them, and he was from none of them at the same time. And people, this is very appealing. Right? Um, 
and and sort of since the end of the Cold War, the turn of the 20s, at the turn of the 21st century, we've seen um, institutions that have sort of tried to create this sort of a, a sense of a globalized sense. I mean, in through networks of communication and commerce and trade and all the rest, right? Um, and there's a reaction to it, right? People feel that that other dimension of being human is very much left behind. And that is why I think Jews have become so, as I said, electrified um, and electrical, electrifying in good ways and, and electrocuting um, a topic in our politics, including in American politics in this day and age, and where does, where does this leave us? Um, because I'd love, I would like to leave time for questions and discussion. Um, these two features, what I've been calling the, the universal and the particular, are features of the human condition. They just are. Uh, Jewish life is such that Jews are made, everyone feels this tension in different ways and Jews have been made to feel this very keenly or deal with it. You know, have, have this dynamic tension running through them very, very keenly. I think that the only way to navigate these kinds of problems is at one and the same time, um, I mean, so to speak, like I, the problem with ideologies is that they go deeper than surface, but not deep enough. What do I mean? At any given moment, we always need to ask on any given political or social question in very practical, concrete terms, how, what will this do? Empirically, what will this hurt? And what will this help? What are the likely consequences of something? by our moral lights, right? while at the same time being aware all the while that we are making all sorts of deep assumptions about what people want universally and what people want particularly. Um, I think the only way to deal with this tension is to talk, is to put it on the table and say that, you know, the universal party, you know, universalism is not the ultimate good and particularism is not the ultimate good. Right? Both are features of the human condition, and there is a variety of ways of trying to work this tension out. Um, the moral principles um, that I try to proceed from in terms of how to think about this um, is, is what, bearing in mind that this is a tension that will never be resolved as long as human beings are around, what do we do to avoid avoidable man-made, human-made cruelty in the near, short, and long term. And there's no obvious answer to that, but there's, I think there's comfort to be had from the recognition that this is an eternal problem, an eternal feature of being a human being um, with all its um, sorrows and joys. So thank you for listening to now. And we have time for questions, and I and I, you know, we're close to twelve, but I'm happy uh, to stay a bit longer than that. And thank you for your patience. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Mursky. We we appreciate hearing your insights and your thoughts. Um, anyone who has a question, please type it into the Q and A box, and we will get to as many of them as we can. So, just to for the, our first question, in terms of Jewish Israeli and Jewish American theology today, do you think they have in common a presupposition of atheism? Hmm. Uh, okay, I'll put it like this. Um, what I take your question to mean, or the way I would interpret that, is that modern Jewish thought has to deal with atheism, which is different from secularism, get that in a second, has to contend with atheism as a live option, not only as a live option um, philosophically, because that was around in the Middle Ages and before, but as a live option socially and politically, right? That there are, um, that there are people and groups and society and social policies fashioned in the light of something like an atheistic idea. Um, I, you know, and so, and that is, that is a fundamental reality, but I think what they, what's more in the foreground, I mean, athe is less, less the idea of atheism than the idea of secularism. And what do I mean by that? 
we tend to use the term secularism and secularization as, as interchangeably, and they're different. I mean, as, as most famously pointed out by the great philosopher Charles Taylor, you know, se secularism, as I, is like, like, like it sounds like, is an ism. It's an ideology. It's an idea. Secularization is a process like mechanization, industrialization, that sort of thing. Secularization is the process whereby the institutions um, that sort of carry and, so to speak, manage and organize a uh, human being's relationship with God, with transcendence, are not dominant in society and are fundamentally alongside or even, or even more like ultimately under the authority of other kinds of institutions for whom religious concerns might be one, but not necessarily central or any concern at all. That's secularization. And that sort of happens everywhere, most everywhere, right? Or that's what that is. Secularism is the idea that um, taking ideas of God, religion, um, out of the public square and perhaps out of one's own life is affirmatively a good thing. And you can be for one and not be for the other. I mean, there, forget about the Jews for a second. Roger Williams, right? You know, Roger Williams of, of the, the founders of America, you know, founders of the colonies in the 17th century, the one who are articulated most powerfully what we've come in America to regard as doctrines of church and state was a profoundly religious man, right? He argued for a kind of secularization in order to safeguard the purity of religion. Right? So that religion not become some sort of partisan political football, it needs to be kept out of politics. Right? And you have Jewish thinkers who say the same kind of thing. Um, I think, though, that, that a major difference between, um, between, Jewish and, between American Jewish and Israeli thinkers and theologians um, are sort of the, 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 the theological challenges posed by the societies in which they're living. And the societies in which they're living shape their theological questions, what do I mean? For American Jews, the question is, how do I deal with what, well, at least until recently, was a fundamentally liberal society, right? A fundamentally liberal society which basically sees people as individuals, which celebrates individual conscience and autonomy, um, in which there is a free market, not only a free market for economic life, but also a free market for ideas and for spirituality and for religion from the get-go, right? Um, America is one of the things that's distinctive about American society is, it was, is that the church is present at the outset. We're a multiplicity of churches um, on the one hand. And Israeli thinkers need to deal with, here I am in a state. Um, there's a state for which I, as a Jew, have to take responsibility as a state. And this state very much defines itself in terms of, you know, that sort of things like people's forms of belonging, religious and ethnic and cultural, are woven into the fabric of the law, right? Um, and what does it mean to take responsibility for a state like that and a society like that? Uh, those are two, and, and, also, and also bearing in mind that this is a society that's heterogeneous. There's a society um, that has many Jews who don't, who don't feel like living by traditional Jewish life, who, who mix and match um, their, their, their relationship to tradition with great uh, freedom, and also citizens who are not Jewish. Right? and for whom the state defines them as not Jewish for all kinds of purposes. I mean, that definition of their being non-Jewish is meaningful to the Israeli state for all kinds of purposes. But as a Jewish thinker, as a Jewish theologian, you have to somehow account for that. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's a better way of capturing uh, the differences between these two uh, communities of, um, of thinkers. Great. Thank you. We have another question here. Um, what well, actually, what is the answer to the current polarization of Americans? And can I also just ask you to speak up just a scooch? Okay, sure. What is the answer to the current polarization of Americans? Yes. <sighs> That's a hard one. Okay, at this point, I'm going to um, sort of make my own uh, political uh, views, which won't come as a great surprise. Um, open. I think step one, of course, is to get Donald Trump the heck out of office. Um, I mean, we have in office, okay, this is now Yehuda Mirsky talking, okay? I'm speaking here only for myself. This is my own political view. I hope I don't offend people by uh, saying this. The current occupant of the White House, remember, I'm from New York. 
I grew up watching Donald Trump's antics. Okay. The current occupant of the White House is fundamentally a mob boss, a mob boss of white collar crime, sort of like a John Gotti figure of white collar crime, who has a genius for publicity, um, a genius for attracting attention and compliment, is one of a great fan of Donald Trump's. He used to work with him in television and now works for him, though it gets paid by him under the table, who I've known for some years, once said to me, look at Donald Trump by any, this is just a quote, um, by any standard of intelligence that you and I recognize the man's an idiot, but he's a genius of the reptile brain. And this fellow went on to sell me eventually, you know, in further exchanges. And people like you are just too stupid to understand what a genius he is and how his policy is a work of art. Directed at you. Um, and he thrives on conflict. He thrives on this kind of thing. And because it's good for business, it's good for money. Um, and it's sort of, he, nothing can ever feed the void um, in his soul. And he's a mobster down to, you know, like a good mobster knows to take care of the clergy, refurbish the church, send the poor people turkeys at Christmas, um, make sure that his family is in charge of everything, make sure that everything is personal. Um, and a number of groups in American society who are not all bad people have decided that he serves their interests whether it's evangelical Christians who have concluded that they can't win the culture wars without him and his brutality, whether it's judicial conservatives who think that only he can ram through the judicial appointments that they like, whether it's medium-sized business owners, you know, the business owners who um, are, are large enough to be regulated but not large enough to be, able, to be able to afford the lawyers who can help them handle all their regulations, white working class people who've suffered from um, deindustrialization and who are neglected. I'm talking about like the kinds of places, like counties in Ohio that, you, that voted for Obama and then voted for Donald Trump. Of course, out and out racists um, who support him and love him and people who enjoy making money from him. There's this marvelous article by Evan Oslis in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago um, about Greenwich, Connecticut of all places, right? How Greenwich, Connecticut uh, uh, went, eventually went for, for Donald Trump because he's good for business. How does one undo that polarization? So again, step one is getting this man out of office. Even Michael, I mean, you know, during the impeachment hearing, say a thing like, would President, would President Michael Pence be that bad? I mean, he wouldn't necessarily be to my liking, but compared to this. I think it's very, very, very hard to sort of figure out who are the people that you can talk to, who you can talk to, and who are the people with whom there really is no talking. Who are the people who will be with Mr. Trump no matter what? Also, you have to think about how helpful is it to tell people, you know, you've been wrong all the time, and now you're wrong all the time, and you should, and you should like realize how wrong you were all the time, and you should tell me now that you know you were wrong all the time. Anybody who's ever actually tried to convince anybody of anything knows that that's entirely not the way. Um, I think if we try to both be very clear about the clear and present danger that Donald Trump poses to America and the world, and I don't say that lightly, I really don't say that lightly. Um, I mean, do we want to live in a world that's run by China? Do we want to live in a world where Vladimir Putin essentially gets whatever he wants out of the American president? Um, I think it's important to realize that Trump and his folks have at times raised issues that liberal elites like me were not paying attention to. I wasn't paying enough attention to the people who were losing from trade and globalization. I wasn't paying enough attention to genuine problems with China. Just take two examples. Um, and one of the problems with Trump is that like he and his people, they sometimes will actually raise genuine questions, but then instead of like crafting a policy, they just picked up, pick up a meat cleaver and start hacking away. And at the same time, I think about trying to convey a positive message of what a better America actually practically could look like, not some sort of kumbaya and all John Hines together. No, but there are ways, we have real problems. There are concrete ways of dealing with problems. We have dealt with these problems before and in a better way. And one thing that's so important, so important, and it's such a temptation this day, these days, is to not give in to anger. And it's so hard, especially because so much of the internet's business model is predicated on anger. Anger drives clicks. It's the devil's own business model. 
and somehow not giving in to the anger that all kinds of people are trying to stoke for fun, power, and profit all the time seems to be to me, seems to me to be the most important step in trying to turn things around. I hope that's something that's helpful. Um, I'm gonna add one last thing. I don't mean like not to be like right, I don't mean right not to have righteous indignation. But there's this thing nowadays that people enjoy being angry for anger's sake. And that happens on the left as well as on the right. And thank you. So we're just, we're about 105 here on the East Coast. So we're just gonna close with one more question for you. And and also just to let everyone know who has joined us today, we will be sending out a video, um, the recording of this afterwards. Oh, actually one other question. We've got two more questions in here. Um, so I'm actually gonna go with, with two more if we have time for, to squeeze those in. Um, and we will be sending out a video um, of this afterwards. It usually takes about a week and we'll get everything online and send you um, that information in an email. So this question is, how is the current rise of anti-Semitism in the United States connected with a rising belief in America that has connected the winners of globalization, i.e. the tech entrepreneurs and Wall Street, the prominent Jews, and that the losers of globalization, blue collar industrial and service workers, where Jews are not well represented? Um, I think that that does play a role. I'll tell you a story. I have a friend who's a Republican who's very anti-Trump Republican, but for spent many years, this is what he does for a living as an opposition researcher. He's one of these people who digs up dirt on people very skillfully. And um, I can tell you, those of you who are regular readers of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times have seen the fruits of my friend's research in all kinds of ways. Um, and a few years ago, he told me that he was friendly with Steve Bannon. And I said to him, oh, I'd like to meet him. You know, because I think smart anti-Semites are interesting people to meet. And my friend said to me, oh, Bannon's not an anti-Semite. My friend, by the way, is an Orthodox Jew, who's um, this anti-Trump Republican opposition researcher. He said to me, you know, Bannon's not an anti-Semite. You got to see it the way he looks at things. He loves Israel. He loves Israelis. Israelis are patriots. Israelis go to the army. Israelis are tech geniuses. Israelis are dedicated to their countries. Israelis kick the daylights out of Arabs and Muslims, and Israelis tell liberals where to get off. They're great. American Jews, he despises. Wall Street. You know, Bannon said to me, my friend said, you know, I went to Harvard and I worked in Wall Street and I worked in Hollywood and I served in the Navy and the only place I never saw Jews was in the Navy. That's because the armed forces are one of the only places where Jews are actually represented in exact proportion to their percentage of the American population. I think this, we know that globalist is a code word for Jew, right? Um, when people say, you know, Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway invests in all kinds of international companies, okay? And when Donald Trump is railing against globalists, he's not talking about Warren Buffett, right? There's a reason why they always go to George Soros. There's a reason why they always talk about New York. There's a reason, now, the thing is, again, you know, what's so interesting is that some of the critiques of globalization are quite real. And the honest truth that I, and I say this in terms of for, in terms in internal for in the Jewish community, I think Jews need to, I think Jews, including Orthodox Jews like me, to give reckoning about the roles that we've played in globalization. I can tell you a good friend of mine who's a tech investor, good liberal, um, an Orthodox Jew, very prominent tech investor. Um, after the rise of Trump, we had a, a heart to heart. And he said, you know, Yud, I got to tell you, the honest truth is, yeah, I wasn't paying enough attention to the people that I was paying out, putting out of work by shifting my investments from certain kinds of industries to other kinds of industries and in overseas, right? I think it's okay to raise those questions. I think it's okay for Jews to ask themselves those questions. When people argue that this is part of some kind of like Jewish conspiracy to take over American life and that it's maligned and that it's seen as a thwart with people's interests. So I think, yes, obviously for some people, it's very on the table, right? Um, and, 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 and in many ways, you know, the fact that sort of these, that the more internationally minded Jews tend to take more left-wing or leftish, dovish positions on Israel um, comports very nicely with this, right? So we're like, you know, that sort of the enemy, there's the enemy without and the enemy within and the enemy within are these liberal Jews who are trying to undermine Israel. That's how you can support Israel. Um, and, be, and despise so many American Jews. You even see these splits inside the administration. In recent years, in recent weeks, as everybody's talking about annexation, um, good reporting, 
analysts that I really know well and trust, have said, you know, there's sort of a split inside the administration on whether or not Israel should be, it's a good idea for Israel to be talking about annexing the territories and how. Friedman, the ambassador, who's a true believer, right, in, in even though he's like a New York lawyer, um, a true believer in Israeli, you know, right-wing politics in a very strong ideological way, um, yeah, really thinks Israel should annex the territories. It's a great idea. Um, Jared Kushner, on the other hand, um, is saying, well, Israel should sort of dangle annexation as a way of getting the Palestinians to the table. And it's no accident that of the two of them, Jared is the one who's more connected to these global elites. Indeed, just last night, Tucker Carlson, literally last night, Tucker Carlson was blaming Jared, implicitly the Jewish son-in-law banker from New York, for Trump's, you know, for Trump's seeming failures to get on top of the riots of recent days. So you see these elements playing out and sometimes very explicitly and sometimes implicitly. And also part of the trick is so, as with so many things these days, part of the trick is like to somehow just like be able to take a step back and analyze things and sift out and like what parts of these criticisms make sense and what parts don't? What are genuine occasions for thinking? And, and what is just, because also remember like all of the ambivalences and questions these days are being weaponized by people through the internet in really complicated ways. By the way, I just, if I have you all here, I, I, there's a podcast I highly recommend put out by the Center for Humane Technology called Your Undivided Attention. And it's people who were ethicists at Google and Facebook and are not anti-tech, but are brilliant at explicating the ways in which so many things on the net these days are designed precisely to inflame us rather than enabling us to work constructively. And I think we have one more question, Sharon. Um, yes, one more quick question for you. Just curious as to um, your current research and what are you currently working on and looking to work on next? Oh, okay, thank you. That's very kind. Um, okay, so I have two books I'm trying to finish over the summer. One, you know, as was mentioned, I did a book on Rav Cook, Abraham Isaac Cook, very important uh, figure in, in Jewish, Israeli, and Zionist history and, and thought. Um, I did a brief book on him uh, a few years ago, and I'm publishing a slightly revised edition in Hebrew with a large Israeli trade publisher. Um, and just this morning, working, just this morning, I was working on both these the projects I'm about to mention now. So that hopefully will be out in a few months. Um, also, I'm publishing a very large, ponderous, scholarly tome on uh, Rev Cook's early decades. And um, I have to say that, given the politics of recent uh, weeks and months, um, you know, being able to dive into capitalistic discussions in late 19th century, um, you know, Lithuanian rabbinic culture has actually been a very welcome relief much of the time. Um, so that's that. Um, and there's also be a lot in there about the history, early history of Zionism and, and so on. Um, next projects, I very much want to write on political thought and on human rights. And um, I'm really interested in the, in the very deep relationships between uh, human rights and theology, because uh, both of those are very about ideas of the sacred, right? For human rights, the individual human being is sacred. Theology is very much about one's relationship with the sacred, with God. Uh, much of the history of human rights, many ideas of human rights originated as religious ideas. And I'm you know, trying to figure out how best to conceptualize that. And it might be some sort of like intellect, an, an intellectual history of aspects of the early post-war, early post-war years, uh, you know, the, the immediate aftermath of World War II when a number of pieces of our world as we know it, right, sort of like, you know, post-colonial nation states, human rights, free trade, um, ideas of civil rights and desegregation and so forth, and apartheid as well, um, all sort of came together. Uh, so that's kind of what I've been thinking about, but, you know, we'll have to see some more literary and slash theological projects perhaps as well, but that's very kind to do that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for giving your time to us today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all and for listening so patiently. And th thank you again. And thank you to all of us for joining us. As I mentioned, we'll be in touch to share a link to the recording when it's available. And we hope to see you at other virtual events coming up. Um, we have a full calendar and more events continue to be added. So please keep checking your email and looking on our website, looking on our social media and more information will be shared for all that. And Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe and healthy.